Welcome to my lecture series on idleness or leisure or in Latin otium or in German muse. I think we'll clarify the meaning of uh, these words in a bit and throughout the course um, of these uh, lectures. Now today I will introduce the topic and then I will talk about Cicero's principle otium cum dignitate. In this lecture series I will address not just Cicero, but also Humboldt, Nietzsche, Bertrand Russell and Martin Heidegger. And I will try to show that especially with modern thinkers, there is something that becomes very pressing, something becomes very important with the question of when the question of idleness comes in, there's a certain reason for that. And it begins, I think, with really with Cicero and this, this very peculiar principle of otium cum dignitate, which means idleness with dignity. And the reason why I think that idleness becomes so important has, of course, to do with what we now call late-stage capitalism, the explosion of intelligence, etc. But there is already in Cicero something at work something that unsettles him, something that makes it for him impossible to enjoy otium cum dignitate. But now before we begin, of course, we need to talk about the, the language that's at stake here. Now, I shy away from the English word leisure because it is affiliated with the capitalist leisure class. I rather would like to speak of idleness. And Bertrand Russell, for example, in his essay, entitles that essay in praise of idleness and not in praise of leisure. And idleness, though, in the English vernacular has a bit of a negative connotation to it. It can mean passivity, laziness, etc. But that's not at all, I would think, I would say, what idleness means. There are other examples um, for idleness that has a, very, has a very different meaning. For example, Samuel Johnson, or Doc Johnson, the man who said, just to mention this, that if a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. Uh, Doc Johnson spent his life arguing for the right to be idle. And during his lifetime in the 18th century, the London uh, coffee house and its intellectual culture were emerging. And literature and cultural magazines, as well as public debating clubs, were flourishing. Johnson was the publisher or the editor of a magazine titled The Idler, which is today published again by Tom Hodgkinson. And as I said, Johnson spent his life arguing for the right to be idle. But idleness for him does not mean passivity or laziness. Instead, Johnson took idleness to be an activity that is, and that's important, non-industrial and in that sense unproductive. That's an activity that is nevertheless rewarding and contributes something very crucial to society at large. It's an activity that Johnson saw under threat with the Industrial Revolution and anything that ensued. Let me also point out what the German word Muse originally meant. In the Bavarian dialect, Muse, or Muse um, used to mean that there was a space available. There's a place, a certain possibility for dwelling. So you would enter the church and you'd think, oh, there's Muse. And that meant that you could still find your place in that space and that that place or space was welcoming. And so there is a certain spatial sense to Muse and I would say also to Otium and also to idleness. But there's also a distinct temporal sense to Muse and idleness and there's a certain lack of idleness in a time, in an age, in an epoch like ours, where time seems to be 
technical and time itself as a parameter, just as space, and maybe a certain phenomenon is occurring that could be called um, tempo side. But now let me turn to Cicero and his principle, otium cum dignitate. Now this would have been quite an unusual principle or saying at the time of Cicero. It would be a synthesis that would not make that much sense immediately, at least, to the people of his time. It would be quite unusual. Why? This is because the Roman society of Cicero's days would not consider Otium a place where you could earn dignitas. Dignitas was earned. You did not just you weren't just born with dignity as we think today. You had to earn it and you could inherit it. But still, dignitas was earned in the public realm by fulfilling your public duties for the res publica for the state. So dignitas is reserved for the public sphere. It is earned in what the Romans called negotium, in the negation of otium, which means business, work, but also hardship and struggle. So dignitas is something you had to earn in the struggle. And once one is in otium, one is outside the public realm, outside the life of business and public office, and one is officially outside the realm of earned dignitas. Nevertheless, Cicero argues for the possibility of earning dignitas also in otium. So he makes it that he synthesizes the two and says that this is possible. But it requires effort. It requires effort to earn dignitas also in otium. Otium, then, is not a time where you do nothing, but it is the attempt to establish a harmonic place or dwelling where dignity can be earned for its own sake, not for the public, not for the sake of the republic or the state, or one's public image, as was so important to the Romans. One's effort to engage in the study of philosophy, this is what Cicero meant by earning dignity, in Otium is that you de devote yourself to the study of philosophy and, and the letters. Now, but only for their own sake. And this is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. To dev devote yourself to the study of philosophy is necessary, but it's not sufficient. There is something else that, that must be at, in place as well. And as we learn from Cicero in a letter to his brother, in the first chapter of De Oratore, the primary necessary condition for the possibility of otium cum dignitate is peace in the Republic. It is not sufficient to just leave the public, leave the state behind and withdraw from public life. The public realm must be in good order. If this is not the case, then a dignified experience of idleness in private life is nearly impossible, if not entirely impossible, for Cicero. The importance of peace and good societal order is itself contained in the word otium, which also means peace and neutrality. As such, otium can be regarded a criterion also for material wealth, just and guaranteed rule of law, and peacefulness. In De Oratore, Cicero also tells his brother Quintus that only in the optima res publica, only in the good states, one, and I quote from Cicero, one qu could either engage in activity in negotio that involved no risk or enjoy a dignified repose in otium cum dignitate esse possent, end of quote. Cicero had hoped for such a life for himself a life that would allow him to engage in the studies of philosophy. Yet, as he bemoans to Quintus, to his brother, the turmoil of the Republic at the time of writing the letter, when it would have been the time for him to really and fully engage with philosophy, the turmoils kept him from it. Cicero's proposed principle is hence not a mere negation of negotium, not merely a ceasing to do anything and entirely abandoning the public good. 
cum dignitate otium is rather the establishing of a harmony in the private studies of philosophy and the arts on the ground of the just order of the Republic. Cicero's proposed withdrawal from office is then not absolute. It requires something else. It requires peacefulness of mind in both spheres. The self-cultivation that takes place in the private sphere is only for its own sake, but it does still require that the state is not falling apart or collapsing. There is no anarchy. Now, this is why Otium, I think, can be understood as a space, a time space, that is free. And it's free for self-cultivation, for its own sake, and free from public demands. Cicero's formula of the possibility of the idle life in dignity is then a, an unusual synthesis for his contemporaries by the standards of Roman nobility. But I think that there is something else also that we can learn from this. And that is that with Cicero, a certain trajectory begins that the collapse of Rome, which took centuries, which might still be visible today, about five times every day if we open our eyes, that this collapse of the, of the Republic made Otium increasingly impossible. And that this struggle returns in modernity where there's, a, of course, there's a very different system at work, but we can ask ourselves whether in hyper-capitalist or late-stage capitalism, there is at all the possibility for a dignified life outside where there is an exit from, from, from the demands of the market, etc. Whether there is this possibility to withdraw from the need to produce and bring about uh, certain effects just for the sake of optimizing results, etc. So that question becomes very pressing. And I think this is why so many modern authors have dealt with the question of idleness or musa and dignitas um, and, and the question of, of how that, that can be experienced with dignity. As we will, we will see, Humboldt thought that the university should be should be absolutely be a place for for leisure and idleness and and the study purely for the sake of self-cultivation nietzsche then is highly suspicious whether whether otium is at all still possible with the coming age of hyper financialization uh, bertrand russell certainly argues in favor so-called idleness but for Russell, we will, as we shall see, this is only possible together with technology or actually on the basis of a perfectly automated society, which can be frightening when we look at the beneath the surface of what, what Russell is saying. And then for Heidegger, there is something else that, that becomes necessary, not, not just a certain withdrawal from the public and, and from certain... Um, offices you might hold, etc., from labor, but really, really understanding for Heidegger, it's important that without idleness, without Muse, nihilism is fulfilling itself and is the rule of the day. We cannot find meaning without releasement and without idleness. There is, it, it's the rule of nihilism if we don't step back. But how that step back is supposed to be possible, I hope we can find out in the course of this lecture series. Um, so I'm looking forward to making uh, the next video and then discussing with you any kind of problems that arise. So please leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and we will see whether there are these possibilities. Because as you know, the project so far for, for this channel or for the entire engagement with, with these texts is not to look bat, back and historicize them, but to see why, why they are important and in how far they are 
really telling us, so almost prophesizing something that that's now coming to fruition. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope you you have enjoyed this video, and I hope you will enjoy the other videos on this channel. Thank you.